Is China on the brink of economic collapse once again? This might be the impression one gets from scanning international headlines. They may have made such insinuations after cherry-picking data released by China's State Administration of Foreign Exchange on Sunday. The 2023 balance of payments data shows a 33 billion U.S. dollar increase in China's direct investment liabilities, marking a significant decrease from the previous year. What does it mean exactly? On a different note, data released by China's Ministry of Commerce showed that the actual annual foreign direct investment remains at a high level, with the latest registering 1.1 trillion yuan, or around 150 billion U.S. dollars, for last year. So how do we interpret the trend of China's foreign direct investment over time? And where does China stand in the international picture? I'm pleased to be joined from Portland, Oregon, the United States, by Professor Liang Yan, Kramer Chair Professor of Economics at uh, William Met University, and on the line from Jakarta by Professor Bert Hoffman of the East Asian Institute of the National University of Singapore. Welcome to both our guests. So before we talk about the Chinese number, let's take a look at the United Nations numbers for last year from UNCTAD, which is the UN specialized agency in terms of uh, foreign direct investment. Global FDI, or foreign direct investment flows, showed a steep 18% decline for last year. FDI inflows to developed countries and developing countries were down by 28% and 9% respectively. So, uh, Professor Liang, how do you assess the general trend that is weak and uneven in Ong Tan's words? Right. Good to talk to you, Liu Xing. So first of all, I think the Western media's uh, numbers uh, could be very misleading. Uh, they are relying on the SAFE, which is the uh, State Administration of Foreign Exchanges number, and looking at the balance payment transactions. And so a lot of the numbers were captured that are not really what we normally associate with the utilized FDI. So I think the Ministry of Commerce, uh, the number $153 billion of FDI inflow, which is slightly uh, lower um, than last Last year, eight uh, percent lower. Um, I think that is more of the number that really indicate the foreign investments yeah. in China. But against the overall now, picture, uh, I just painted, yeah, for for the whole world. Absolutely. I think you're right. We need to put that 8% slowdown uh, in context. So one of them, as you just mentioned, is that the FDI is declining. It is also declining uh, in terms of the FDI inflows to the developing world. When you look at India, um, their FDI inflow has gone down by 47%. ASEAN has gone down by 16%. Brazil, 20 some percent. Mexico, also 21%. So that's against this big, you know, context that the, this big picture that, you know, FDI uh, inflows to many developing countries has gone down. And that largely has to do with the fact that, you know, many of the advanced countries have raising their interest rates and these interest rate hikes um, have increased the returns on um, their assets. And so that attracted a lot of the FDIs mm -hmm. flowing to those respective, yeah. you know, advanced countries. Let's, um, and yeah, let, let, let me, let me. Yeah, uh, we, we come back to you a bit later, Professor Liang. Let me go to Professor Hoffman here for his assessment because there is a difference between uh, direct foreign direct investment inflows or outflows with direct investment liabilities. It's a little bit technical here, but I want to go to Professor Hoffman. Tell us how much does this number indicating direct investment liabilities reveal the health or attractiveness of the fundamentals of an economy? Well, that consists of two parts. One is really direct investment, as we would understand it, i.e. investing in, in factories and in businesses in a country. But the second is also that is basically more portfolio investment, that is retained earnings that are kept in a country, uh, but they're being withdrawn if macroeconomics changes. I think a lot of what we see in China's numbers is the latter part. So the balance of payment numbers are, are so poor, in part because Companies that before used their retained earnings to temporarily invest in China's capital markets now take them out and they invest elsewhere, particularly in Europe and the United States, where interest rates have gone up sharply. I think that's the main picture. But the second part is globally, we've seen a lot of uncertainty. There's a lot of uncertainty in trade, a lot of uncertainty in growth. And I think investors are a bit reluctant to commit uh, as to where would they invest next. For China, 
the added uncertainty is the U.S.-China dispute, the, the threat of decoupling, the mm. threat of de-risking, and, and companies feel uncomfortable in making bets at this particular point in time. Mm. If you look at the actual annual foreign direct investment in China, the trajectory is actually quite different from the kind of picture you're going to see in mainstream international media. As I said, uh, we, found, we did a bit of uh, you know investigation, and the numbers, for instance, for the year 2020 was 1 trillion renminbi. For the year 2021 was 1.15 trillion. The year 2022 was 1.23 trillion. Uh, for last year's 1.1 trillion, so it's it's a, a rather, um, you know, tranquil line, if I can put it, there, a stable development. And China's foreign direct investment for last year was actually higher in 2023, higher than that in 2020. Professor Liang, what does that say about the kind of actual foreign direct investment in China? Right, I think you are absolutely right. So this number that we're looking at, one trillion, uh, one one hundred and fifty-three billion last year, was eight percent down uh, from the two thousand twenty-two level. But let's not forget, twenty twenty-two was actually the highest on record uh, since the comparable data was published, you know, in two thousand fourteen. So despite you know the small slowdown, or like you said, uh, still relative steady change, um, you know, the FDI in China is still uh, you know high. And I think that also speaks to, you know, the confidence in the Chinese economy, despite, you know, a lot of the Western media also, you know, talks about China becoming increasingly in, uh, in, uh, uninvestable. Uh, but I think I also wanted to make the point, uh, when we look at the general FDI picture, we also need to understand, you know, from a foreign business point of view, China's economy is changing. Uh, it is now moving towards a new model that is led by digital economy, you know, new energy sectors, new te technologies. And so a lot of companies do need to pivot and recalibrate. Um, for example, uh, Mitsubishi, right, was wondering if they should continue to produce cars in China, given that, you know, chi China's automobile production and also EVs mm -hmm. are now so competitive. And so for some of the markets seeking FDI, they have to need to rethink their strategies. Um, I also echo with what uh, Professor Hoffman was talking about, that the US-China relationship uh, could have uh, some negative impacts. Uh, one case yeah. in point, China used to account for 48% um, of the global chip-related FDI, but 2022, that number plunged to only 1%. So that you know has to do with the US's yeah. restrictions on you know the, the high-tech uh, exports yeah. and investment well, in China. Um, uh, I, yes. I do want to. I, would, I do want to point out there is, um, you know, some very striking graphics on international media reports. For instance, this this one, and not against this particular media, but this one by Bloomberg, for instance. Uh, the, the headline says foreign direct investment into China collapses, it equals foreign direct liability to inbound foreign direct in investment. So you see, over the past few years, there is a wild fluctuation. According to their chart, China was the darling for the world during COVID times, and the chart saw a huge upsurge during 2019, 2020, 2021, and, and all of a sudden now it kind of fall out of favor. Professor Hoffman, does that really reflect the actual movement or trend of foreign direct investment for such a chart? Because it's, it's very striking and it could be misleading. I, I wonder what your thoughts are. Uh so, so uh, th these are the balance of payment numbers. And as I said before, they're, they're very complicated. There's a number of what really are more portfolio investments put, put into that mix. So the picture of utilized foreign investment may be a, a better reflection, and they're, they're much higher. At the same time, that's a very slow-moving target, i.e. companies make plans and they get implemented over three to four years, and therefore that's what you see in this year. Those are the plans three years back. Uh, we, we do see some uh, t tendencies in surveys, and uh, we at the East Asia Institute, we've done our own surveys in companies that are becoming more reluctant and they're threading sideways, if you want. So they're still reinvesting the profits that they make in China, but additional capital from abroad is becoming less, uh, less frequent at this point in time. So mm. there is a bit of a hesitancy, but that's not just China. So there's also the rest of the world. Where do supply chains are? Uh, where are they moving? Who's going to be in the lead? Where yeah. should be? Where should companies be in in future to be at the center of those supply chains? Yeah. That's a big question now, and there's a lot of uncertainty. 
Uh, sure, sure. And uh, I'm just wondering, you know, whether this kind of reporting and the kind of association, um, again, Professor Liang, we're looking at very um, influential media organizations such as Financial Times. This time they claim that China's inbound direct investment fell to its lowest level in 30 years, which is apparently not the case because China's foreign inbound foreign direct investment last year was actually higher than the year 2020 as we I just said and yet you know you are looking at the same picture that I just explained how misleading could that chart be because China's foreign direct investment inflow is at a very high level still and not lower compared to many other countries in the world except the United States where the interest rate has gone up much higher Right. I mean, I agree with you. I think, you know, this reporting uh, could be very misleading, uh, but the same medias that you mentioned, for example, Bloomberg, they also in other reports that talked about China's actual use license FDI is, you know, $153 billion. And again, just a slight drop from 2020. That's good. So that I think the reporting, the yeah. right. Right. I, they, they do have different kinds of reporting. Like you said, you know, this is really how you cherry pick some of the data and try to make a different story about, you know, China's environment or its business, uh, you know, environment. Um, but that said, I think, again, we need to also think about, you know, some of the substance here um, that on the one hand, I think, you know, just by looking at the FDI numbers, it not it doesn't really speak a lot about, you know, the reality. Um, you know, Untan also mentioned that, you know, for example, there has been an 8% increase last year in terms of the greenfield project announcements. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we are likely to see, you know, the return of the FDI. Yeah. And let's not also forget about, you know, at this point in time, what matters really for China is not the amount of FDI, but really the quality of the I sure. and what kind of foreign investors can bring to the yeah. country. Um, uh, when you look I at the high tech manufacturing, for example, yeah, it's, it's definitely going up in terms of high-tech and especially high-tech manufacturing. Very quickly, Professor Hoffman, how do you look at the number of joint ventures that are set up in China last year? Increased by 40%, went up by 54,000, and the investment in high-tech manufacturing also gone up by 6.5%. Quite striking. I think there's also a, a whole new part of the world that is getting interested in investing in China. So. Some of that you find reflected in new joint ventures being set up. Mm -hmm. Definitely um, a transition period, I would say, from quantity to quality. We'll keep a close watch on the situation. Many thanks to Professor Liang Yen and Professor Bert Hoffman for sharing with us your valuable insight.